thank you all for attending today's Tirana Tuesday, Bead Compliance and Strategy, Critical Timelines, Hybrid Tech Strategies, and Exclusive WinCom Services webinar. Presenting today from Tirana is our Global Government Affairs and Policy Man Manager, Gabriel Moran, and also representing from WinCom Technologies, our very own Fiber Product Manager, Alex Cernick. If anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to add them into the chat and they will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Alex, you're up. Awesome. Thank you, Don, for the uh, for the wonderful introduction. And Gabriel, thank you again for, for taking your time. And then for all of you uh, that are joining, again, thank you for, for taking the time. My name is Alex Cernick and I serve uh, a dual role at Wincom, um, part as a fiber product manager and part as a bead program manager. I always like to start off these presentations by providing just a quick overview on Wincom. Now, it's been for almost 13 years now, Wincom has been a leading global provider of cutting edge solutions for network infrastructure. Now, today I'm excited to talk about how hybrid networks are empowering BEAD sub grantees to deliver next generation services to high cost areas. Now, by partnering with companies like Toronto Wireless, we're here to help you access the right products and services from the submission through the deployment. But our offering goes much beyond our wide range of products. We provide a comprehensive suite of technical support that includes engineering, design, and consultative services. Now, with multiple warehousing facilities at our disposal, we're equipped to configure, to kit, and to deliver solutions exactly when and where you need them. So to provide just a, a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today, uh, this slide gives a, a nice little roadmap. So first, we'll talk about the latest BEAT updates. So what's happening with the, the Volume 2 approvals? Where are our states progressing to? We'll then get into a little more details on pre-qualification timelines. We'll speak about preparing for BEAT and understanding the pre-qualification and financial match components. We'll talk about the proposed alternative technology, technology guidance um, and BEAD's opportunity for fixed wireless access. Gabriel will spend time talking about hybrid technologies, the strategy associated to that. And then we'll bring this full circle with Wincom's BEAD services. We'll, I'll go over a briefly about our product eco center where each vendor has been carefully cultivated based on either bead certifications or bead waiver wire eligibility. We'll talk about some of our enhanced services through pre-engineering and through application services. And as Don mentioned, if there's any questions whatsoever, leave them in a chat. We can address these on the webinar. And if you'd like to have a more detailed conversation about what's happening in your particular state, if it's guidance rules on when the pre-qualification or what the requirements are or how to find project areas, we're all available for one-on-one -on -one consultation. So first we'll start just with that bead update, which again is updated information on the progress of volume twos and some of our pre-qualification deadlines. So this has changed uh, a little bit since the last time I did this. Previously, we were at 46 out of 56 states had ratified NTIA approvals. Now we're at 51. Now, why this is so important, there's a time clock associated to this. So as the NTIA ratifies a state's given volume two, the clock starts at, at one year, 365 days. So in that time period, that state has to finalize their challenge process, right? The rebuttal process, the reunification process. Ultimately, from there, they create their final eligibility list. They define their project service areas, which could be very diverse. Some people do it based on PAUs, which could be counties. It could be multiple census blocks. Um, a lot of states are doing it by census block as well. So again, part of that ratification process, it starts that that, that linear timeline of having everything completed. Again, challenge process, the project area, and then most states are looking at pre-qualification. Now, Gabriel is gonna talk about what those states' requirements are looking like, and we'll walk through all, all, all 50 states. Perfect. 
Thank you, Alex. Hello, folks. Uh, as Alex mentioned, my name is Gabriel Moran, and I am the Government Affairs and Policy Manager here at Toronto Wireless. I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy Tuesdays to join us today for this uh, really important update on the BEAD program. I think it's safe to say that BEAD is here for all states, uh, and if it is not currently underway in your state, it soon will be in the next three to four months. Uh, I think it's helpful to just review kind of where all the states are at just to get a better sense as to how the NTIA is, is really thinking about moving forward in this process to ensure that uh, providers and states have as much time as possible uh, to develop a bead plan and bead projects that meet the congressional goal of 100% universal service for all Americans. Uh, the states that we are going to review here, um, you know, we're just going to be reviewing these alphabetically. For any states here that you see that have an asterisk uh, in front of their name, these are states that have yet to receive Volume 2 uh, approval from the NTIA. Starting with the great state of Alabama, uh, Alabama is currently completing the rebuttal phase of its challenge process. This is the final, this is the, uh, the phase wherein uh, the Alabama Broadband Office uh, reviews uh, or allows providers who have had their service uh, availability challenged by uh, nonprofits or individual citizens uh, provide counter evidence to show uh, that they do in fact provide service. Um, the Alabama currently plans to commence the final determination phase of its challenge process on October 17th with a desire to end the challenge process by uh, November 17th. Moving on to Alaska. Uh, Alaska uh, you know, is still awaiting volume two approval. Uh, they currently do have a draft published on their website uh, that does include NTIA feedback that they have received. So uh, if you are based in Alaska and you're interested to see what the finalized volume two might look like, I encourage you to go on their website to take a look. Um, they are currently wrapping up their uh, or they've wrapped up the challenge process earlier this summer on August 4th, and they're currently waiting for NTIA approval of their challenge process results. Um, you're going to notice that with a lot of state, a lot of the states that we're going to be re reviewing today, uh, many states are unfortunately in a holding pattern. Um, you know, after they've received the after they've received um, you know, volume two approval, they still need to get approval on their challenge uh, challenge process results. Um, and several states are, have been waiting multiple months for that. But um, Alaska is currently planning to initiate a 120-day application period for interested parties to apply for bead funding. Uh, they had tentatively uh, stated that they were hoping to open this period on November 1st, uh, but I do think that is going to be subject to change uh, depending on when they get their volume two approval and when they get uh, approval of their final challenge process locations. Moving on to Arizona, Arizona is currently working with its providers to do some market sounding to figure out uh, which project area units would make most sense for their providers. Um, they are currently looking to open applications in late November and have not yet identified a date to start accepting those applications. Moving on to Arkansas, uh, the pre-qualification period uh, opened on July 8th, and according to the Arkansas Broadband Office, they uh, expect to continue to keep pre-qualification open until the end of their first round of bidding. Uh, this round one or tranche one bidding is, in, is expected to begin in mid-October. Um, however, I do believe that the Arkansas Broadband Office is going to be releasing an updated program timeline based on the fact that they just recently received approval of their initial proposal volume two. Uh, California, they are, California is currently wrapping up its challenge process uh, and they're kind of adjudicating the final results that they've received from challengers and the challenged. Uh, the CPUC, which is the California Public Utilities Commission that's overseeing this program, uh, anticipates uh, sending the NTIA challenge process results uh, for approval on November 4th. They have not yet announced when they plan to initiate the bead application process. Uh, for Colorado, the bead application window is currently open and will close on October 28th. 
uh, for the great state of Florida. Florida is currently uh, in the process of navigating the rebuttal and adjudication phases of the challenge process. Uh, they are currently hoping to submit these results to the NTIA for review no later than November 21st, 2024. Uh, you know, they're still waiting for that volume two approval. Uh, so I think it's, you know, certainly want to keep uh, you know keep your eyes peeled for any updates from the Florida Broadband Office. Uh, for the state of Georgia, Georgia has completed its challenge process and uh, is currently waiting for NTIA approval of its challenge process results. Uh, it, they have yet to announce the start date for the application window. Moving on to Hawaii, Hawaii is still running its 90-day challenge process, which started on August 19th uh, and is slated to close on November 18th. Um, once the challenge process concludes and the NTIA approves the challenge process results, uh, Hawaii plans to hold two rounds of uh, RFPs or requests for proposals, one to serve, uh, one for projects that serve unserved and underserved broadband serviceable locations, and then another RFP that uh, is specifically for projects to provide gig symmetrical service to community anchor institutions. Uh, moving on to Idaho. Idaho, Idaho wrapped up its adjudication process on October 1st, 2024. Uh, they are currently in the process of standing up their BEAD application and portal process. Uh, I, I would say check back on the Idaho website in the next two weeks. I anticipate that the portal will be published uh, fairly soon. Uh, moving on to Illinois. Uh, Illinois uh, has anticipated starting the bead application process in October, uh, pending NTIA approval of its challenge process results. Um, the state currently you know, is still waiting for those results, so I think they're not accepting applications until providers know kind of what they're bidding for. Um, the state says that it will publish a map of all eligible locations 30 days before the beginning of the formal application process. Uh, in addition, Illinois will publish a state-specific notice of funding opportunity for the BEAD program, which is uh, slated to be published in the next month or so. And finally, for this slide, uh, for the state of Indiana, uh, the pre-qualification process for providers wrapped up on September 27th, and they are currently targeting a mid-October date for round one of bidding. Um, like many other states on this list, Indiana is waiting for NTIA approval of its challenge process results. Thank you. Moving on to Iowa. Uh, Iowa just had their volume two approved this morning. So actually that makes 52 out of the 56 states and territories that have bead volume two approval. Um, they, Iowa has just proposed the publication of a notice of funding availability uh, through the state to administer the program. Um, they have yet to publish that in, that publish that note that notice of funding availability, and we are awaiting additional information from the broadband office. Uh, Kansas, uh, they have published their NTIA, NTIA approved broadband serviceable locations and project uh, proposed uh, project areas as of September 26th. Uh, the subgrantee application process is slated to begin on October 21st and will close on December 5th. Moving on to Kentucky, uh, the pre-qualification process uh, just is going to be ending on September 13th for providers. Uh, Kentucky has yet to provide a date for the commencement of formal BEAD app project applications, um, and they have yet to receive NTIA approval of their challenge process results. So again, once they get the NTIA approval of the challenge process results, they'll be able to publish those locations, and then they can really uh, you know, solicit applications from providers. Louisiana is in a unique position uh, in that it has concluded two rounds of bidding um, with the last round having closed on September 25th uh, uh, last, uh, last month. So they are currently reviewing the uh, applications that they have received. They're going to have to figure out if they need to do a third round to kind of fill in some gaps. Uh, but Louisiana is done for the purposes of uh, bead bidding. Uh, for Maine, uh, the pre-qualification process for providers is underway from September 18th to October 18th. Uh, they're still waiting for NTIA feedback on their challenge process results and proposed project funding areas. Um, but within 30 days of the close of this pre-qualification period, uh, the Maine Connectivity Authority, the Broadband Office, uh, will 
notify uh, prospective applicants of their pre-qualification status, whether they've been approved or been rejected. Um, and for the approved providers, they can move on to the bead project application period. Um, they have yet to announce when they will start that process up, but I would, you know, I would think for a mental benchmark for providers in Maine, you would look at sometime 30 days after October 18th uh, for that application period to open. For Michigan, uh, Michigan is still waiting for NTIA approval of their challenge process results in project areas. Uh, Pre-registration had opened earlier this summer on June 28th. Uh, and the Michigan Broadband Office has informed providers that they will accept and review uh, pre-registration or pre-qualification documentation on a rolling basis until 30 days following uh, the opening of the uh, project bidding window. Um, the application window is currently predicted to be opening in late October for fiber applications, and then uh, a non-fiber project round will open in March of 2025. However, uh, you know this is entirely subject to change since uh, the Michigan Broadband Office cannot continue until they receive the finalized beat eligible locations and project areas from NTIA. Looking at Minnesota, uh, Minnesota is still adjudicating the bead challenge process and. Uh, which is slated to end on October 21st. They have yet to announce the start dates for the BEAD application process. Again, they're still waiting for NTIA approval of their challenge process results, uh, which are not going to be submitted until after October 21st, so they have some time. Uh, moving on to Mississippi, Mississippi completed their challenge process as of October, 20, uh, or October 7th. Um, the Broadband Office has told providers that they're planning to publish eligible project areas uh, on October 15th uh, with the desire to start accepting applications on December 9th. Uh, this application window will uh, run until February 6th of 2025. Um, so, you know, it's helpful to have that for a frame of reference, but again, you know, if you're based in Mississippi, I would be checking the broadband office's website fairly regularly since, uh, you know, the NTIA, NTIA approval of the challenge process results is going to kick out this timeline necessarily. Uh, for Missouri, uh, the Missouri Department of Economic Development is currently reviewing their submitted pre-qualification materials. Um, the pre-qualification applications are currently slated to be due 15 days prior to the end of each bead scoring application submission period. Um, so the only bead application period that they have provided dates for is round one, and that is slated to open on November 15th and will remain open for 60 days. Uh, and then finally for this slide, uh, Montana, the pre-qualification round uh, began way back in March. Um, they are they've started accepting uh, applications on October on August 13th of 2024, uh, and they anticipate keeping the pre-qualification and main round application portals open uh, three weeks after it receives approval of the challenge results. So Montana is is doing its best work with the NTIA's um, approval process. Uh, of course, as of uh, as of today, Montana has still yet to receive NTIA approval of its challenge results, so that does hamper their ability to move forward. Excellent. Uh, moving on to this next slide here, Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska has received its Volume 2 approval, um, and they are currently, I think, waiting to publish further guidance as to next steps for providers interested in participating in the BEAD process. Uh, Nevada, uh, they are currently accepting applications for their bead program, uh, and they will be uh, closing their application period on October 10th of 2024. So they are very much well underway here. Uh, for New Mexico, New Mexico uh, is still waiting for NTIA approval. They just submitted their, their challenge process data at the end of August. Uh, so they are currently, uh, you know, Currently, you know, in the in the waiting negotiation feedback phase with NTIA, um, but at present, you know, they're currently planning to publish the bead eligible locations around the end of around the end of September, early October. So it's already end of September. We're definitely still in early October, but I would, you know, but they have said that they plan to publish that information no later than November first. Uh, the bead pre bead pre-qualification process is currently open in New Mexico uh, and the final deadline to submit 
any material as part of that process is November 1st of this year. Moving on to New York, uh, New York has concluded its pre-qualification process as of September 30th, uh, and they plan to announce the pre-qualified ISPs or applicants on October 30th of this year. Uh, the broadband office has yet to announce when they are going to begin soliciting applications for the program, uh, and, I, and I imagine that likely has something to do with the uh, delay in NTIA approval of their process results. Uh, North Dakota, uh, we are awaiting further guidance from the North Dakota Broadband Office. Uh, moving on to Ohio, Ohio completed its challenge process on September 11th. They are currently working with the NTIA to, um, to get final approval of their volume two so they can really open up the application process and uh, get going. Moving on to Oklahoma. Oklahoma is currently uh, running its challenge process and they anticipate that they're going to be running it until January 15th of 2025. Um, so the, obviously once they wrap that up, then the broadband office will need to get NTIA approval for the challenge process results. So uh, you know, Oklahoma still has a good bit of time in its bead process. Uh, moving on to Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania is currently uh, put, publishing information uh, for providers' consideration about the pre-qualification process. Um, they have yet to announce a start date for that. Um, and I think that once they get NTIA approval of their challenge process results, that's when we'll get a little bit more clarity on the timeline there. Uh, South Carolina, uh, they finished up their challenge process on July 15th, and they're currently awaiting uh, NTIA approval for their bead eligible locations. And then finally, uh, Tennessee uh, is currently accepting, quote, letters of intent until October 9th, tomorrow. Letters of intent are essentially a, another a term or phrase for the pre-qualification process, um, but with an added step for providers to identify which uh, locations or geographies or areas they are hoping to serve with their uh, bead project. Next slide, please. Excellent. Thank goodness. We're almost done here. Um, as of October 2nd, uh, the Texas Broadband Development Office has just I had just identified its subcontractor uh, vendor to run the challenge process. So uh, they have yet to start the challenge process. They have yet to publish additional information. So it's not clear when that is going to start. Uh, looking at Utah, Utah has completed its challenge process on July 9th. They are currently waiting for NTIA approval of these uh, locations before starting the challenge process. Um, so we will be waiting to see more information from Utah once they get uh, some federal approval. Uh, Virginia, Virginia is currently accepting uh, letters of intent and will accept letters of intent until November 30th uh, of this year. Uh, and similar to many of their peers across the country, the broadband office in Virginia is waiting for NTIA approval of its speed eligible locations. For the state of Washington, uh, Washington has finished its challenge process as of August 3rd and is waiting for NTIA approval of its list of bead eligible locations. Uh, West Virginia initiated its full application phase on August 26th uh, with the intent to keep the application window open for 60 days until October 25th of this year. Uh, the West Virginia uh, Broadband Office has noted that certain locations may be eligible for an extended application um, window or timeline, uh, but they will publish more information about those locations as they get a better sense of, of uh, where their current applications fall. Uh, for Wisconsin, Wisconsin recently closed its letter of intent window on October 1st, 2024. Um, after they uh, have a chance to review the submitted letters of intent, uh, the Public Service uh, Commission in Wisconsin that's running the BEAD program will announce the participants that are eligible to compete for, uh, for locations. Uh, right now, the bidding process is currently slated to open in mid-November, uh, but obviously this timeline will be subject to revision as uh, you know, various federal and state processes run concurrently. Uh, and then finally for Wyoming, uh, Wyoming uh, is, you know, 
accepted pre-qualification applications from uh, August 15th to September 14th. At this point in time, Wyoming has stated publicly that they plan to accept round one BEAT applications in late October to early November, pending NTIA approval of its challenge process results. So, still a little bit of time there in, in Wyoming. Next slide, please. So, Gabriel, that was fantastic information. And for everyone listening, that, that really provides uh, an up-to-date overview of what each state is doing, the timelines and the processes. But I, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't just take a moment, one, give Gabriel a, a minute break, but um, go over some of the value-added services we offer. So as we were going through each state's individual timeline, I, I chose to showcase our, our B portal and then an example is Colorado. So we have all this great information um, on our B portal. It's very easy to reference. But in addition to providing you with those timelines, we also provide you with the content and the data that you're going to need throughout challenge processes, throughout pre-qualification to application. So using this again as an example, one of the things you could see here is um, grant summaries, um, which are Google Docs we export, detailed summaries, overviews, project workbooks um, that, that go into details on the application process, links to Colorado's portal to their broadband map and how do you define a project service area um, to their eligible final locations and list of community anchor locations. Um, what is their scoring rubrics? H how do you maximize your BEAT application? You have to know exactly how they're going to score applications and we provide that information along with FAQs and definitions of high cost areas. So again, this is a resource we leverage apart with our one-on-one -on -one consultative service. So again, I, I, I couldn't stress this enough. If you are in the process or thinking about applying to pre-qualification, let's set up a one-on-one -on -one consultation where we can understand what states, what counties, what census blocks, and we can help build out your strategy to optimize your success. So Gabriel, I'm going to hand this back to you. Perfect. Thank you. So next, um, you know, I, I want to talk about two really crucial, important parts of the B program, uh, specifically the pre-qualification process and the financial match. Um, both are crucial and traditionally really thought of as being important for uh, kind of the kind of the start of the BEAD program, not really something that providers need to be thinking out, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, kind of six months to a year into the BEAD program, uh, because there are going to be some really interesting opportunities for providers that I'll talk about a little bit after this, uh, where what, you know, where the items that states are making providers uh, submit or think about for the pre-qualification phase, uh, you know, is going to be uh, relevant and, and germane to some of the steps that we're going to see states take uh, well into the BEAD process. Next slide, please. Excellent. So what is what is the pre-application or pre-qualification process? Uh, so the pre-application or pre-qualification process is this first phase where uh, states are looking to vet providers who are interested in participating in their state's bead program. Some states choose to have this optional pre-application or pre-qualification process before they open up kind of formal uh, project bidding, just so they save themselves a little bit of time and grief on the front end to make sure that they are getting uh, project applications from providers who are capable of uh, undertaking the proposed projects and capable of, uh, you know, participating in the in the bead program. Um, and there are kind of really key buckets that the states are are looking to get evidence uh, of or kind of information about uh, each ISP that's just interested in participating. First is the financial capacity and capability of uh, the internet service provider. Um, and really, most states are looking for documentation from providers that shows that they have, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
good financial statements. They've got good business plans that uh, you know that actually show that they're you know running a legit business. Um, you know they want to see your ability to secure a letter of credit as part of the program. They want other certifications and docu documentation that shows that you know you're a financially healthy and sophisticated uh, business who is going to be able to take on the burdens of a uh, you know million to multi million dollar uh, broadband project. The second bucket uh, that they're looking for is, you know, organizational capability. Uh, they want to see that, you know, your ISP has uh, the right, uh, you know, technical uh, and, you know, financial and administrative expertise to endure and be successful and be a, a long-term business, not something that is a kind of a fly-by-night operation. Um, you know, they want to see your your past or current compliance with regulatory filings, whether that is with uh, state entities or with federal agencies, that it, that is really crucial. Uh, and they also are going to really want to see your ability or kind of attestation of your ability to comply with uh, federal uniform guidance requirements, which uh, is a prerequisite as a, as a part of a lot of these a lot of these federal awards that have come down in the last ten years. The third bucket is your technical capability. Um, you know, they want to see that you have the skilled and credentialed workforce to undertake a, a broadband project, or if you don't have the skilled and credentialed workforce, you have the the contractor relationships in place to successfully undertake the project and and meet your uh, deployment and service obligations. Uh, kind of similar to kind of what we discussed with the technical and organizational capability, um, you know. State broadband offices want to see a track record of past uh, regulatory compliance. They want to see your ability to, uh, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's um, and stay on the right side of the law with all of these, with, with various programs here. Um, moving on to federal labor and employment laws, uh, kind of similar to what we discussed with the uh, uh, organizational capability, you know, they want to see your ability to abide by federal uniform guidance requirements for employees. Uh, they want to see your ability to, um, you know, to ob observe existing federal labor and, and state labor laws. Um, and, you know, just, just be able to run a, a, <laughs> a good business that runs its, its personnel uh, professionally, sa safely, and well. Um, risk management. Uh, this is a pretty key uh, area for the program, and I think has been definitely a pain in the side of some providers as they think about whether or not they want to participate in the BEAD program. Uh, state broadband offices want to see evidence of, uh, you know, your NIST cybersecurity compliance uh, and your NIST supply chain risk management plans. Um, that's something where that's going to take a lot of time. It can be very expensive. Um, that's something where you you really want to jump on that now rather than later. And I do think that taking these steps now for the BEAT program can be beneficial going forward as future funding opportunities become available on the federal and state levels. Uh, in addition to information about kind of the, just the general ownership of, uh, of the business, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, ink spilled about the BEAD program and the uh, Build America, Buy America compliance requirements uh, adhering to existing, uh, you know, historical and environmental preservation um, uh, statutes. Uh, so they're going to want to see attestations or past demonstrated compliance with NEPA, uh, with the National Historic Preservation Act, and with Build America and Buy America. And with BABA in particular, I know the folks at WinCom uh, are in a very good position to help providers get ready uh, to check that box. Next slide, please. Excellent. So, uh, so now talking about the financial match requirement, um, you know, the financial match uh, is a huge part of the BEAD program um, and, and a huge part of its success. $42.45 billion uh, to close the digital divide in 56 states, territories in Washington, D.C. Uh, is just not enough money. And in devising this program, the NTIA definitely had a vision of healthy private sector match helping to supplement and augment the historic investment made by the federal government. Um, and they want providers to offer as much match as possible. You see this in the fact that, uh, you know, as you review all of the 
uh, kind of the scoring criteria for the states and the territories, you see that minimal bead program outlay comprises 40 to 65% of your total project application scoring. Uh, so your ability to contribute um, at, at least, or not just uh, meet the 25% minimum match requirement, but your ability to exceed the 25% match requirement is certainly going to be a big predictor of your application's success. So when I say, uh, you know, uh, a provider has to offer a 25% minimum match. What exactly does that mean? So what that means is that for any given broadband project that a provider applies for, uh, you know, federal funds will uh, federal funds will provide or pay for 75% of the project, but the applicant has to contribute, you know, that remaining 25% of the project cost. Now. The provider doesn't just have to come up and you know show up with a duffel bag full of cash uh, for the state and just say you know hey here's my 25% uh, match you know it, it's done. There are some creative ways that the federal government has spelled out for providers to offer up that that financial match. Um, you know, so of course, you know, there is the conventional cash match where you are offering up, uh, you know, you're offering up cash directly for the project. And then there is this in-kind match, which is a non-cash donation of property, goods, or services. Um, and this is kind of a way for you to be a little bit more creative and explore ways where you might be able to, if you're currently able to offer that 25% cash match, you might be able to offer 30% because you can, you know, take 5% and say, well, I'm, uh, you know, uh, there's a certain number of man hours, there's a certain amount of equipment that I know that I'm going to offer up from my business for this project. We'll have that represented as an in-kind match. Um, so that in-kind match is definitely something I think providers on this call should be paying attention to and should explore uh, for the purposes of the BEAD program. Uh, match is federally not required for high cost area deployment projects. However, uh, although it is not required, states are heavily incentivizing and encouraging providers to offer up a match, even for those high cost areas. Uh, so definitely something to, to think about there. Um, in addition to the, the cash match, which we discussed, I also want to take a second to talk about uh, existing state and federal funds, uh, which are available and can be used by providers for the purposes of, uh, for, of the match requirement for the BEAD program. So any state funds that were appropriated through uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the CARES Act, uh, uh, the ARPA, uh, ARPA Act, uh, any of these buckets of federal funds have been specifically identified by the NTIA as being eligible for use in matching uh, matching funds. So those state funds might still be available in your state. Um, there might be an opportunity for you to leverage them for match purposes. And I would say that um, you know if you have questions about the, you know, your state's applicability for these funds, I would say you want to reach out to your state broadband office as soon as possible to get some information about that. Next slide, please. Excellent. Um, so one thing I did really want to talk about on this call is this very interesting development with the NTIA, uh, who on August 26th of this year published a draft proposed BEAD alternative technology guidance uh, that essentially spells out for state broadband offices how a state would accept uh, broadband technologies as part of the BEAD program that are not necessarily considered to be quote unquote reliable for the purposes of the BEAD program. This really opens up an interesting opportunity for unlicensed fixed wireless providers uh, who I think had really you know, counted themselves um, you know, out of the BEAD program. Uh, this is an opportunity for unlicensed fixed wireless providers to participate in the BEAD program. Next slide, please. Excellent. So, you know, before I begin, I want to say that, you know, what I discuss in the next couple of slides is subject to revision by NTIA. Uh, the documentation that was published by NTIA was published for the purposes of receiving public comment uh, from states, from the private sector, from uh, ISPs. Uh, so it is possible that what we discuss today will be slightly changed or tweaked depending on the feedback received by NTIA. 
So first, I want to I want to define what constitutes an alternate alternative or an alternate technology. Uh, an alternative technology is defined by the NTIA as any broadband access technology that does not qualify as quote reliable broadband service but is capable of delivering 100 by 20 megabits per second with a latency of less than or equal to 100 milliseconds. So, you know, reliable broadband service is thought of in the context of the BEAD program as fiber optic cable, licensed fixed wireless, uh, hybrid of uh, unlicensed or licensed fixed wireless, uh, HFC cable, uh, technologies that are generally accepted by the federal government as offering, you know, dependable, quote, reliable broadband service to consumers. But this alternate tech, alternative technology, alternative technologies category really encapsulates the low earth orbit satellite uh, uh, technology space, which is really, uh, you know, one vendor at Starlink. Uh, and then unlicensed fixed wireless, which is traditionally not considered to be reliable. This guidance that has been published now talks about how the states will can accept low earth orbit satellite and unlicensed fixed wireless as part of the BEAD program. So. In instances where the enti an eligible entity, a state broadband office, has project areas that don't receive subgrantee bids for reliable broadband service, or they do receive bids for reliable broadband service, but they exceed the high cost per location threshold amounts, the NTIA allows states to consider alternative technologies. There are three specific cases that uh, the states, or excuse me, the NTIA proposes to states to use in order to navigate situations where you have uh, unbid or not cost-effective locations. The first is a state broadband office can look at the project areas that haven't been bid, and they can check to see if those areas are already subject to an enforceable commitment. An enforceable commitment essentially is like a uh, you know an existing uh, state or federal funding program like RDOF, for instance, that would be an enforceable commitment. Um, but you know, essentially, if there's already an existed state funded project or federal funded project in the area that has network performance monitoring uh, as part of the project requirements, capable of ensuring that the project one will be completed, but two will also be delivering service that can be monitored for quality to ensure that it is providing Bead per, you know, service that meets the bead performance requirements. So that 100 by 20 megabit per second uh, threshold and your latency requirements. The second option is for uh, the states to identify existing alternative technologies that are already, uh, you know, already in the area and are already offering speeds that meet bead performance requirements. So if you're an unlicensed fixed wireless provider in a, in a given area and nobody bids your location, the state broadband office could come to you to uh, validate and certify that one, you're already offering uh, service in the area and that you're offering service that meets the bead performance requirements. And then finally, for the third case, if neither of the two, uh, two cases above apply, uh, the state broadband offices have to identify a last mile broadband deployment project to serve the relevant unserved uh, or underserved locations. And that introduces a secondary process uh, where the state essentially is going to run a, a mini uh, bead application process to solicit applications from eligible entities with alternative technologies uh, to serve that area. Next slide, please. Excellent. So, you know, I already kind of covered this in depth, but I really want to loop this back around to the pre-qualification slide that we had just reviewed earlier. Uh, because as part of this process of identifying an existing alternative technology service provider, the state broadband office has to put the provider through its paces. Uh, you know, similar to any other uh, provider that is interested in participating in the BEAD program, uh, the state broadband office wants to get assurance that this alternative technology provider has the financial and managerial capacity to undertake this project. Uh, they want to know that the alternative technology provider has the technical and operational capacity to complete the project. Um, so the state, the, the NTIA hasn't spelled out how states demonstrate the financial and managerial capacity or the technical and operational capacity, but 
it's clear that the NTIA wants the states to leverage the existing pre-qualification processes that have been baked in uh, to their state programs. So I think that if you are an alternative technology provider who thinks that you might be in a situation like this, I would seriously consider undertaking the uh, the kind of the pre-qualification process that we discussed, looking to get compliant, uh, and then also communicating directly with your state broadband office to get some indication as to what your state broadband office is going to be looking for should they be in this position where they're going to be looking to identify alternative technology providers. Uh, and as part of this case two requirement, um, from the identification of a unbid uh, service area, uh, the state broadband office has to give alternative technology providers in the area the opportunity to indicate interest uh, to the state broadband office. Next slide. Excellent. So that final case three, the, the case three that I discussed, where essentially if case one and case two don't apply, uh, the state broadband office has the option to uh, hold a uh, you know, essentially select a subgrantee to deploy an alternative technology to serve that serve you know those unbid locations, um, and there are there are two ways that the NTIA has spelled out for state broadband offices to make that selection for those alternative technology projects. The first is you know kind of a formal application process similar to BEAD, albeit on a condensed timeline. Um, to have all types of providers and technologies apply to serve that uh, apply to serve a given area. The other option that the NTIA gives is uh, uh, essentially have a more selective subgrantee selection round that just looks at alternative technology proposals. Um, it'll be interesting to see kind of what how states kind of uh, in, interpret this guidance. I will say that just because, you know, states are already running on that 365 day clock, they already feel the pressure of, of time, uh, you know, coming up on them. I do think that if a state uh, broadband office were looking to choose between these two options, I think they would likely go for the second option and really just only do a subgrantee selection round looking at alternative technology proposals since, um, you know, I, I don't. I think that they want to limit the number of applications that they have to review, and they will, you know, make the educated assumption that if a reliable broadband technology provider participated in the conventional rounds and didn't bid, they're they're not going to bid this time either. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see how this process, uh, you know, takes place. Uh, and then, you know, additionally, if an eligible entity just receives no proposals, the B notice of funding opportunity does contain express language, which would allow broadband offices to engage directly with an existing provider to expand their existing or proposed broadband service. Next slide, please. Excellent. Uh, now we're going to be talking about hybrid technology bits, uh, and and this is a really crucial. Uh, you know, topic and opportunity. Um, you know, hybrid technology bids are essentially project applications that utilize a mixture of reliable broadband technologies. So, you know, a certain portion of your project is going to be fiber, and then another portion of your project could be licensed fixed wireless or HFC cable. And I think that, you know, when the NTIA was thinking of this process, uh, they had envisioned that providers were going to be submitting these single technology fiber bits. Uh, but, you know, I think that, you know, three years later, as more states have worked through this process, they've learned lessons from other programs that have occurred in the intervening years. Um, you know, I think that they found that many providers uh, are just not going to do that uh, because project application areas contain a an amalgamation and a mixture of broadband serviceable locations. Um, there are going to be clusters of broadband serviceable locations that will be harder, more resource intensive, and more expensive to serve uh, with any given technology. So what we've seen is the NTIA and the states have adopted a much more flexible position, uh, and they are in, some states are encouraging providers to submit project bids to deploy both fiber and another reliable broadband technology to keep project costs down while also ensuring everybody un, underserved and unserved gets the broadband service that they need. Um, 
applications with multiple reliable technologies for service uh, you know, are generally going to be considered for an award if they can satisfy the speed of service requirements. So think about that 100 by 20 megabit per second threshold and can attain a lower cost per location within the project areas due to a combination of technologies. So those are the key criteria to be thinking about about whether a hybrid technology bid makes sense. Next slide. Excellent. Um, and kind of additional reasons why we think the hybrid technology strategy makes so much sense. Uh, one is that, you know, I think that a lot of states have been envisioning this like multi round bead process uh, where, you know, broad, state broadband offices are going to have more applications than they know what to do with. They're, you know, it's, it's going to be a highly competitive process. And I think for certain states, that's definitely going to be the case. But I think, um, you know, states are already running up against that 365 day timeline to run you know two three even five rounds of project bidding and i think that as a result we're going to see a much more condensed timeline with fewer rounds of bidding maybe even just a single to two rounds of bidding um, and a hybrid technology approach like this is helpful for situations where you're going to have these truncated bidding processes because negotiation is going to be key. State broadband offices are going to be negotiating directly with service providers to uh, change or extend their project bids. Having a hybrid technology bid that is both fiber and wireless gives you the ultimate flexibility during the negotiation process to adjust your project details based on cost or state broadband office feedback. There are many states that have large pro defined project areas, school districts or counties, think Oregon or Kansas, um, and those large defined project areas are just not conducive for, for single technologies. Similar to what I had said on the prior slide, um, you know, utilizing a mixture of technologies will ensure that you're achieving full universal service in a given project area, but without breaking the bank that robs other broadband serviceable locations of the opportunity to get broadband service extended to them through the BEAD program. Um, as you are considering where to bid with your hybrid technology uh, projects, I would say take a look at the NTIA identified high cost census block groups in your state and territory. There's obviously been some change in the you know, in, the, in the last couple of years, but the NTIA has published and has identified high cost census block groups for each of the states and territories. Uh, take a look at those areas and see if there are opportunities that make sense for your, for your business or for your strategy. Um, and, and then, you know, finally, I wanna highlight on this point because it, it is most important. Um, for hybrid project bids, you want to utilize technologies that are capable of providing, quote, future-proof and scalable broadband infrastructure. What does that mean? If you are using an alternative broadband technology in addition to fiber as part of your project application, you should not just meet the 100 by 20 megabit per second bead standard, you should look to exceed it. Um, showing your ability to offer additional capacity to consumers beyond just the 100 by 20 megabit per second standard is going to give state broadband offices more of a reason to feel comfortable and safe with approving your your bead um, uh, your bead application um, and, and, and you know and again and i think it's you know, and then in addition, you also want to have technologies that show that you can add additional homes or BSLs that may be constructed in the future, um, and you're still able to offer comparable speed or service to those homes. Next slide. I know we are starting to run out of time, so I'm going to be very quick here. Um, you know, if you are interested in hybrid technology bids, I would say you want to check with your state to see if that is something that is an option. Uh, your state's volume two initial proposal should have that. Um, if you're not currently signed up to your state broadband office's newsletter or social media, I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, that is usually the best way to get up-to-date information from your state broadband office as to where they're at in the process, where they're at in their negotiations with the NTIA. Uh, it's a good way just to get some familiarity with the activities and priorities of your broadband office. Uh, in addition, I would say, you know, as you think about uh, the alternative technology bead round, take a look at your state's pre-qualification process and start reaching out to your state broadband office to get a better sense as to how they're thinking about the alternative bead technology guidance and um, you know, what you can do as a provider to get ready for that. 
Uh, this may seem obvious, but I just want to say it. Please engage with your state broadband office. Uh, you know, you want to be a familiar face for good reasons with the broadband director in your state, but it's crucial to have that face time so they know that you're a known entity that they could go to if they have questions about your application, your business, your customers. Uh, in addition, please get access to your free CostQuest Tier D FCC bead fabric license. I know the folks at Wincom, I believe they can help you with that uh, and they will absolutely hold your hand to, to help you get through that process. And then finally, for hybrid technology uh, bids, consider partnering with your local fiber providers to complement their bead or their bead projects or bead networks um, uh, as they start to submit those. Excellent, so Gabriel, thank you, that was, extremely informative and, and again I'll, I'll state if anyone has any questions about any of these processes please reach out and, and we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation now I know we're coming to the end of this uh, webinar presentation but just at a very high level I just want to take a moment to discuss some of our enhanced services that we offer here at Wincom Technologies now strategy first starts and I think we talked about uh, or Eco centers, right? Um, providing best in breed product eco centers that allow us to address if it's active fiber on XGS Pond, if it is an OSP application that could be either aerial, barrel, and the corresponding ancillaries by looking at high cost areas and being able to service those with middle mile, um, which could be either E band or licensed microwave technologies to the towers and infrastructure themselves, to Toronto's CBRS solution. Um, one of our goals here at Wincom is to be able to identify and provide products that are both compliant or meet the exemption rules. And a key part of the application process uh, as a sub-grantee, you need certain details and criteria from each one of those vendors. So our, our goal here is to turnkey this experience and make it simple. So at the bare minimum, we can certainly provide those products, we can provide those compliance doctrine, um, but again, we do have enhanced programs that we can leverage to make this somewhat complicated process simpler. And that could start with pre-engineering through our QGIS database. We can help you plan what counties are strategic targets. From those counties, what asset locations um, are currently uh, involved in your network? What are some future asset locations? How is that state defining project service areas? And by putting all these things together along with areas that are unserved or underserved, we can help you identify the right strategic target. Now, once that target is identified, there's several different paths we can help you with. First is planning. Um, as Gabriel went through, a lot of states now are moving through pre-qualification. What do those applications require? Um, is it something as simple as uh, Tennessee, where it's six questions in an online form and it's a letter of intent? Or is it more complicated like Louisiana or Illinois, where you need to define your technologies, define your project service areas, and put together a more in-depth application, or sorry, pre-qualification submission. So we can help you go through what those requirements are for the states and identify each piece and component. We also have a grant writing service. So that could be something like turnkeying the tire experience where we can collect all your financial documentation. We can help develop and derive your, your narrative. We can identify the budget, the technology, and then submit that on your behalf. And there's also a post-award compliancy component to this to ensure that once you win these bids, money does not get clawed back. Now, in addition to that, we can offer high-level fiber designs. So with a unique tool that provides AI-driven feedback, we can do several things. We can pull from CostQuest, the tier D locations for residential and commercial. We can identify the best hybrid spine. We can compare and contrast fiber versus wireless in high-cost areas but it also gives a win-loss analysis 
it gives a 10-year pro forma, and it gives the ability to understand the total costs associated to that. And all these are critical components of putting together that, that final application. Now, in addition to the AI-generated fiber spines and the, the grant writing services, we also can offer professional engineering services. It could be as complicated as putting boots on the ground. It could be as simple as offering PE stamp drawings. So all of these, again, are services rendered to keep it simple, provide you with one point of contact, and then we have a dedicated team of people behind this. And we bring this full circle with our financial suite of products where we can either help maximize your CapEx by carrying grant writing or professional engineering or high-level fiber designs over a three to four year period, or we can help with the 25% grant match with equipment financing. So again, two different directions and multiple different layers or levers to pull. And again, we bring this all for a circle. So I'll open this real quick. Do we have any last minute questions? I will I not see any questions, Alex. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank everyone for your time. Gabriel, thank you. This has been extremely informative. And I guess the last thing I will say, this is episode one. We have we have three more episodes coming, and each one is going to add a layer on the previous. So please look forward.